Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining our RV Nug meetup today. We are very excited to have all of you here with us today. Uh, we are a hybrid group and have both online meetups and in-person meetings. But no matter the venue, we always bring you great content from some of the best speakers. And today is absolutely no exception. We have Mike Benkovich presenting on working with ChatGPT for developers, a hand-on approach. Mike Benkovich, uh, he is a developer, uh, business owner, consultant, cloud architect, Microsoft Azure MVP, and an online instructor. He's an alumni of Microsoft from 2004 to 2012 where he has built developer communities across the US through work on Microsoft across America, MSDN events, MSDN webcasts, DPE, and Channel 9. I love Channel 9. I spent quite a bit of time there. Uh, he's helped create and grow developer community conferences and user groups in various cities across the US. While at Microsoft, he helped create the Azure Bootcamp events uh, that were run in cities across the US and at PDC and TechEd. I remember them well. Uh, and before he, it was transfer, you know, transferred over to the community. In his spare time, he helped start a Toastmasters club for geeks called Techmasters in Minneapolis, where he grow uh, speakers for conferences. He's a LinkedIn learning instructor for Azure, having developed many online courses. Mike actively works in Azure cloud governance, application architecture, and software delivery consulting. Mike's website equips developers with tips and resources to help get grips on technology, including cloud, data, devices, and he produces online courses covering areas like Azure Enterprise Development and serverless computing. Mike is also a chronic sharer of puns, so just ask Dad if you're after a laugh or a groan. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for uh, coming to our humble group today. Take it away. Thank you, Tolga, and uh, hello, uh, Roanoke. You know, this is a I'm not sure where you guys are, what you've got with uh, the weather lately, but I'm up in Minneapolis and uh, we had snow here last week. So nothing like a couple inches of snow to keep the little munchkins from come the marauding down the road and uh, ended up with uh, not as many trick or treaters as we might have liked. But um, hopefully we'll have uh, the demo gods will smile on us today. It's a chat GPT dev talk. And the idea is to kind of dig into what do developers need to know about it. But just to kind of give you a background of myself, um, I am on LinkedIn. There's a barcode there if you want to scan that. We can be friends on LinkedIn. I do answer that uh, pretty pretty co uh, consciously. Um, I've been doing a lot of different things. My, my website's on here. I'm on Twitter. Well, I guess X now. And uh, the other thing I do is I do Azure Office Hours on Fridays, which is 15 minutes. Talk about anything Azure. Uh, just click the link. It'll uh, set up a Zoom call for us. And yeah, you can have some fun with that. But today, we're going to talk about the topic of AI and, and in particular, ChatGPT and Copilot and how that can help us go out and make things really great. Um, we'll kind of talk about what are large language models, we'll dig into how they work. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, the Azure OpenAI service and how you can use that to build your own chat application if you want to uh, be able to tie into how that works. And then have some idea of other things you can work with, things like prompt flow, which is a way you can build out uh, like a, a workflow to be able to make your uh, interactions with those large language models uh, even better than, than they currently, than they are just by themselves. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. And you know, there's all the question of, you know, why do we care? What is it that's, you know, what is there to worry about? AI is just a, it's just another service, right? It's just another thing. It's not new though. Um, you know, we were talking about the AI that's in uh, OneNote even, you know, it has been for a long time, the different ways that computers try to make things easier for us to go out and do things, find things, understand things, summarize and, and all of that. Um, but you know, to kind of get, get a handle on this, uh, sometimes I've found that when I start talking about it, some people haven't really, are, are kind of newer to it. And you know, it's like, what can you do with, with uh, chat GPT and AI and all of this? And so I'm gonna switch over to my browser here and I've got uh, my browser. This is my site here, but I've got uh, ChatGPT, and I'm logged in with a free account, so I can just go out and be able to kind of get started. But one of the things I like to find out is, you know, help me um, explain uh, ChatGPT and large language models and how they work. And just because it's so nice to know that I don't even have to think about this, um, it can go out and tell me all of this, but. That's kind of a little bit verbose. Um, let's do this. Explain it to a 
15 or a 12 year old. Um, because I figured that I need to be able to understand and explain exactly what ChatGPT is and how it works. Um, I can use it to go out and help me identify and process language, ask it questions, you know, explain this uh, in lyrics. And it'll then go through and give us a song about uh, ChatGPT. So you can really see that, uh, you know, kind of diving into it, you know, it, you must be aware it's not always right. Mistakes it makes in the day and in the night. You know, but uh, really, as a limerick, notice that I don't even have to tell it what I want. It's keeping the context of what I'm asking. And when you think about how language processing used to be, you know, like going out and doing a search and you get a list of websites, it's like, oh, great, now I can go read these websites to try to find what's useful to me. Now I can use this to go out and just process language. Um, but you know, writing songs and having fun like this, I mean, I could say, you know, how do I, how to change spark plugs? And it'll give me, you know, the answer for things I need. And it's interesting that, you know, it's like, not only does it get the, you know, the uh, things, but it says, you know, you need, uh, you might need uh, a ratchet, you might need some, uh, rags because it's like in context going out and searching the entire world trying to pull back uh, stuff for us. But of course, instructions on things like this is interesting. I could also say, you know, hey, uh, actually, let's do this. I'm going to use the voice to text. If you press Control H, it'll actually go out and start typing for me. Don't want to do that. All right. Create an asteroids game for me. In a single page HTML, let's try this again. Create an asteroids game for me in a single page using HTML and JavaScript, comma. Create, put it in one file. Do not give comments or explanations and make sure to include ships, asteroids and make them a different color than the background, period. Allow me to shoot the asteroids with a space bar and the game ends when I get hit or when I shoot all the asteroids, period. Display it all when it ends. And it'll go out and do stuff for us, like write code. Now, code is coming from a codex model, which is a slightly different uh, AI model than uh, what a large language model, but it's also based on the same concept of being able to predict and provide context on what it is that it thinks I want. Kind of interesting, writing code like that. Yeah. Is this something that we should be thinking about? I think we need to scroll up and copy this code. So. What I'm kind of hoping we can do is maybe create a game and actually write some code today. So I actually have out here in Benko Tips on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash Benko Tips, I've got a repo called ChatGPT for devs. And in here, this is where I'm gonna have the code and I'm gonna create a branch for us that will be our code when we get done. Um, I've gone ahead and created a poll of that and I've got that in here. And I'm gonna go out to my code, and just kind of explain what I've got here. Um, I've got the chat GPT for devs. This is that repo. I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to add a page. And I'm going to say, call this asteroids. Asteroids1.cshtml. And you might be asking yourself, why did Mike call it asteroids1? Well, let me show you. Maybe I'll be able to show you. We'll add a page tag. And then I'm going to come down here and we'll paste in some code. And there's our code. And I can see if it works by just doing the, the old F5 and run this. Um, It'll spin up the or the local web server. And after a little bit of thinking and processing, it'll come back and give us a page here. So this goes out. There's my welcome to my local page. If we go slash asteroids one. Ooh. Ooh, it doesn't move. I can shoot though. Ah, that's kind of broken. All right, well, game over. I, looks like we failed. You know, we'll call it a day. We wrote code. We're done. Thank you for coming. Wait, no, let's have it fix it. All right, what were the problems? Let's go back over here. My ship doesn't move. Fix it. And let me rotate with the arrow keys. At which point, 
then I find that ChatGPT is very apologetic and says, yeah, okay, here, we're making some changes to it. Um, we can see it's iterating on the code. And so once this gets done generating, so I can see that now it's done, I can copy the code, come back over here to our asteroids. And let's take this and go to my files. Let's add a new file called asteroids2. And add the page tag. Because I didn't tell it about the page tag, but this is uh, CSHTML is like Razor, so it's it's better. Um, and then we can go ahead and, and do the uh, F5 to run it. Again, it'll go out, spin it up for us. And it'll go to Asteroids 2. Ooh. So now it rotates, but it's still broken. Oof. I don't know about you guys, but this is not quite the game that I remember as a kid. <laughs> but the cool thing is that by going out to a prompt, I can say, do something like this. Um, I played around with Tetris. I played around with Pac-Man. Um, and it gives you something that is a starting point. It's not going to give you polished stuff. Although I found that one thing about ChatGPT is that it makes me ask better questions. How can I improve those questions and iterate on it to come back and you get something a little bit better. The idea of how it works, though, that's that's why we're here. You know, because we can play games you know all day long, but really digging into what it's doing and understanding that that's where we want to go. So let's take a look. There's a lot of scenarios that AI you know comes into customer experience, whether it's risk management. There's all of these different things that you can see that we could go out and apply this to. Um, you know, uh, predictive analysis all of these different aspects, but it's really understanding what is a large language model and what is it really doing? Um, from a very high level, it's a prediction engine. When it takes as input, it generates something that's output. It tries to figure out what comes next. And, set, and it, if we give it context, more information about how we're asking, it can get better and better about being able to answer our questions. So a large language model is, is you know, based on math. And, um, there's some great articles that are out there. I put some, put some references into that GitHub repo. So if you go to this and you scroll down, I guess you'd have to go to the finished branch. They, let's see. But there's a branch that's got, uh, Stephen Wolfram's got this thing on, what is chat GPT, do, chat, you know, chat GPT doing and how does it work? And this is a fairly long article, but he dives into how chat GPT works and it's, yeah, when I say it's a long article, I mean, look at it's like, wow. Anyway, um, there's some there's some great reading if you have a couple hours and nothing to do. Um, but what it's doing is it's going out and it's basically providing output that comes from input and it's summarizing, looking for how to figure out what comes next. Um, if you take a, a corpus of data, like say uh, a Wikipedia article on cats, and you count up the number of times each letter occurs in that article, you would come back with a breakdown graph that says, yeah, there's a lot of E's, there's a lot of C's, you know, T's, and it's like there's a percentage of what letters would are in that. And if you look at a letter and then see what letter comes next, you could go through and try to figure out how do I go out and pick, you know, the next letter. So in a two gram, which is uh, two pairs of letters, you'll notice that if I have a Q, that the most likely letter is gonna be a U, at least in the English language. So from this, we can kind of see how it will go through and based on what it's got, be able to predict what comes next. And if we were to take that out and say, well, here's three letters and then what's the fourth letter? But you go out and you say, what's 50 letters? Or instead of letters, you start doing it with words. Um, as you keep doing this, you, keep, you, you come to a spot where uh, the large language models has more and more likelihood of trying to get something that is human-like or matches the language or the data that it's been trained on. Um, as a prediction engine, we are kind of predicting you know, what comes next. You know, and also um, one of the things about uh, large language models is it's a built on top of like a neural network. And uh, in 2013, Google had this thing called word to vec which was a way to say a cat is related to other things like a uh, dog and rabbit and whatever. And if I see that you know, a puppy is more connected to dog and to pet and kitten, 
And it tries to find these meanings of how these different neural networks are connected and pre predicting some numbers on saying, well, which of these things connect to the um, to these different vectors on that. Well, GPT built on top of that. And in GPT-3, um, they do this with over 12,000 dimensions, which means that they're going out and pulling in dimensions on how these words are related in all these different ways and creating these uh, weight maps of numbers that kind of pull the data back together. Um, and then if you take a look at how it transforms this and goes through multiple iterations, uh, there are different transformers. And so GPT-3 was uh, one of the first large language models that really kind of surprised us a lot on how good it was. Um, but it has 96 layers with the 96 attention heads, which is like how the different points are connecting to things to try to figure out how to predict what word comes next. And I don't expect you to be diving into this to get all of this because it's a lot of information in this. Um, but the history of GPT, you know, in 2018, the first iteration of it had 110 million parameters, which means it was trained out on that many different ways of looking at, at this. Um, the sequel that came a year later had a billion and a half parameters. Um, and, and we think that's a, lo a lot, but then you look at the magnitude change when GPT-3 came out, 175 billion. And, uh, and then the growth on this is just pretty amazing and pretty impressive. Um, but understanding kind of that vectorization and how do these things work, and it's just, and I say it's math, I think there's a tool that kind of you know, does a, a good job of explaining this. Um, if you go to the OpenAI platform and you go to slash tokenizer, tokenizer, and open this up. This is AI's large language models where you can put some text in here. Um, let's put some text in. I'll, it's a beautiful day in, to be a Minnesotan and to have fun uh, talking at a .NET user group, which is really kind of cool. So we'll see what this looks like and if we get enough text in here to make a difference. And if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see that it's adding tokens and characters to the list. Sometimes a token is a whole word, sometimes it's part of a word. And you can see down here, I, I'm using 83 tokens in this. And if I look at the token IDs, this is where it kind of got me. It's like, these are like numbers, an array of numbers that is somehow being sent into an engine. And then we get stuff coming back out. And it's trying to tweak how that all uh, kind of comes together to, to give us something useful. But when we're going out and we're playing with this stuff, um, there's a playground too, and this is where we're looking at prediction of how things uh, work. If you go to the playground, I'm just gonna close that guy up and come over here to complete. And then I'm gonna move this over here. And I can show probabilities on here and show the full spectrum. What I can do with ChatGPT is I can say, give it a starting point. ChatGPT is a great place to start working with large language models because, and then submit. It'll go out and tell us, okay, as a chat bot, I can assist users in engaging conversations. But when I look at the playground and I've got this uh, spectrum turned on, I can see uh, things like the likelihood of these letters. So like this first word, uh, as is only 6% likely to be that next word that comes in. If ChatGPT always picked the top word, and so I know, you know what, the, what the math tells me the next word should be. If, if I always pick the top one, it's gonna come across very robotic, not very interesting, definitely not human. But if you inject a little bit of, sometimes I pick a, a, one that's a little bit lower on it, then you get a little bit more of the randomness, which I guess is kind of you know telling us something about ourselves. And when you talk to people, it's like, hey, wait, you're off the wall. It's like, maybe that makes a difference. Because I can take this and I can adjust how the, the large language models work. Um, there is a thing called temperature. And temperature is a uh, parameter I can use to control uh, the ram randomness of what the completion looks like. So for instance, I can say, hey, let's dial this up or dial this way down. So we've got very little, very little temperature. And if I were to rerun this query, let's, let's do another one. Let's reset this. And we'll say this. It's a beautiful day in Minnesota, comma. 
I think I'd like to make tacos. And then submit. And it will then go through. And you can see that it's pulling almost all of the most likely thing. And if I were to rerun this multiple times, it, I'm going to probably get something that's very similar. But if I dial up the temperature and we go back above where that middle point is, say we go up into here, you know, 1.18, and then we resubmit. Looks like it's sunny and warm outside. So let's gather up some ingredients. Yeah, that's a little bit more interesting. Um, of course, if I dial this up a little bit more, maybe a little bit more randomness, see what we get. At this point, you can see, I'm not quite sure what it's doing, but it really went off the rails. And the idea is that you can control how your response is going to come back from the large language model. I can also adjust the length. I can say I want a real long length. I can use a very short length. Um, but one of the things it's doing is it's adjusting how many tokens I'm using to be able to do that. Because when I'm talking with large language models, I'm, I've got a limit on how many tokens I can push into it and be able to process from it. Um, there's other, other uh, parameters here. Uh, the top P controls and a few of the likelihood uh, things. Frequency, so you can say, I don't want to have duplicates. I want to be you know, more original or less original. Um, you can also inject things uh, into it as well. Any questions on large language models and kind of getting a start on that? The, um, the way that we can work with this also is uh, using uh, what are known as vector databases. If you remember, those tokens are an array of numbers, and they represent some different kinds of vectors. In uh, vector databases is a way that I can store information and be able to search it very efficiently and very effectively. Cosmos does a great job of this. Um, and trying to get my, uh, my response to be able to take input and be able to provide output means that I really do need to understand a little bit more about how, uh, how it works. And there's this thing called a retrieval augmentation pattern, which is I'm injecting more stuff into how the, the service runs to be able to kind of control how things come back out. Um, we'll talk about that here in, in just a minute. But one of the things I like to kind of describe is that um, when I think about what is a large language model, I, I remember when I was a kid that uh, my parents took me down to Williamsburg. I don't know if you've been to the cabinet shop there, but the guy is in there and he's making this beautiful furniture and it's got and all the nice dovetails. And it's like, you know, I decided to build my daughter a desk. And so I was like, this is cool. So I went home, got my uh, saw out and I was like, okay, I'm going to make this desk and it's going to be great. And I tried to cut the dovetails the way that they did it, you know? And, and so after about the fifth try, I went over to Rockler and I bought this dovetail jig. And uh, the neat thing about it was that I could put that thing on. And after I adjusted the jig, I was able to cut a perfect dovetail every, every time. What a large language model is, is it's like a j dovetail jig that you can use for language. Now, you don't put dovetails everywhere. You, don't, you, you use them in certain places. And it's understanding how and where you want to apply the tool that is the, the, the key to getting value from the tool. Yeah. We've got fun, fun stuff ahead. Because it's like, how do I use this? How can I apply this and make it work? Well, as a developer, I've found that uh, Microsoft has been working very hard to try to make their IntelliSense even more intelligent. And the team that worked on it, uh, Mark Wilson Thomas, a friend of mine who's uh, kind of part of that project, has been talking about this for about five or six years. And the interesting thing is that with the large language model, it went from being, oh, yeah, here's a, a little bit smarter IntelliSense to, hey, this is something that could actually be pretty darn useful. Um, what GitHub Copilot is, is it's a, it's a tool that uses and builds on the uh, language models of uh, the LLM of ChatGPT, as well as Codexes. Codex is a model that's trained on code, where a large language model is trained on the internet of text and things. Um, but it's a tool that I can go out and I can uh, start working with um, with the GitHub Copilot. So let's go here and say GitHub. GitHub Copilot is a paid service, or if you're on a if you've got a um, uh, an enterprise license, you can get uh, GitHub Copilot. There's a couple different plans: uh, ten dollars a month, hundred dollars a year for individuals, or nineteen for business. Uh, what you get when you are working with this is a way that you can use that uh, Copilot to 
do some interesting things. So for instance, I've got GitHub Copilot installed and I've added the extension on here. So if I go to my VS Code and I open up extensions and I say GitHub Copilot, um, you'll see I've, I've turned on the GitHub Copilot. This is the current release, it's enabled. And then I have GitHub Copilot chat, which I'll show in a second. Um, but with this turned on, you might say, well, what can I do with it? Well, I was thinking that I really ought to do a little bit better job of explaining, you know, what is Copilot? So Copilot, or what is GitHub or chat GPT is, let's see here. And at this point, I'm seeing I've got all kinds of errors coming up. And I would expect that my GitHub Copilot is uh, asleep or something. Why isn't it working? Well, let's do this. I'm going to open up my terminal and I'm going to go over here to uh, output. And I can say, here's my GitHub Copilot. It says, I'm not signed in. Okay. So this failed on get adder. Okay. It appears to be offline. Let's take this and try this again. Open up. And this happened to me once before. I was uh, about to show how the co-pilot works. And the uh, interesting thing was that uh, GitHub was actually having an outage while I was doing my talk, which wasn't very fair. It's a horrible coincidence. <laughs> it is. There's an icon that shows up. And this says, here's my co-pilot status. And it says it's ready, right? And I say, go to GitHub co-pilot. Oh, look at that. So now it's actually doing something. And I can see in the log that it's going out and hitting the copilot proxy. And in fact, if I come down here and I start typing, um, what is ChatGPT? And ChatGPT is a, come on, and this is where it should go out. Oh, look at this. So now I can see the log down here. So I mean, I'm showing you the behind the curtain of what it's doing, but it's giving me things where I can say, yeah, it's a language model that can use to blah, 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 blah. That's great. Um, let's do Copilot. How does Copilot or ChatGPT work? That sounds like another good thing for my documentation. Um, and you know, it's like it makes a suggestion and just kind of puts it in front of me in kind of a light gray. Now, you might say, do I want that? Is that the wording I want? If you don't like that, you can hold down the control enter key and it'll open up a, a set of suggestions for GitHub Copilot. And so what this should be doing is it's going out and synthesizing some solutions. Um, and I can see that on my log as well down below, which you'll see in my output window. It's gone through and it's actually generated a good amount of how to use Copilot, use cases, how to get started, uh, conclusion, next steps. I don't know about you guys, but do you ever get like, you know, asked to write more documentation? Not that, not that we would use this, of course, because this is just ideas that we might build on. Uh, one of the things I've found is that, yeah, this is interesting, but it does get a little bit predictable. ChatGPT is a language model it can be used for this. Da, 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 it can generate text, can generate text. Yeah, okay. So because it sort of works means it's kind of gives you a good starting point, but I would be careful. Um, on the other hand, it is nice to have an assistant who's here to help do this. So if I say, how does Copilot work? Work, yes, that's what I meant to say. Um, I can use it for documentation. I can also use it to write code. So let's go in here to our Asteroids game. And suppose I want to have a, uh, a function to add, a, add an event listener, arrow up and arrow down. So I can just use that and then maybe I want to test it. And let's do this as a comment, control KC, comment, and then see if this suggests it, something to test it. Um, but it will look at different types of, of code and language and be able to make uh, suggestions for us. For instance, I can come in here and I could say function to add to numbers. Yeah, there we go. Test it. 
So then you've got something that uh, can go out and do that. Um, I could also go to back to my Asteroids game, and I could say uh, GitHub chat, which is the uh, second extension I turned on. So when I went here to Copilot chat, um, the chat is, uh, is a window that does a little bit more than just the IntelliSense. Um, this gives me the ability to go out and say, OK, here's my chat. Explain this code. If I have an error, I could say, hey, fix this code. Now check my firewall rules and my connection. It's not found. Try it again. Explain. Uh, so it's having some issues with my internet. Um, but what it normally would do is give me a, a description saying, well, here's how this works. And it breaks it down and shows all the different parts of what that, um, what that should look like. Um, so I can use Copilot to help be my junior coder, my junior assistant. Um, an example where I've used this is uh, I've got a, uh, just some uh, things where I wanted to go out and share. Uh, my parents are getting older. They moved out of their house, so we downsized them from where they were. And my mom um, gave me a box of old uh, movies, old film, like, like these, which is, you know, an eight millimeter film. You know, it's literally, you know, you got the, that kind of a thing. And what was interesting was um, on Amazon, I was able to go out and buy a, a film to digital converter. And it was cool because I was able to plug it in and it would step through all of the, all the frames on the three minute film. It'd take about 30 minutes. But it would take a picture of each one and then assemble it back as a as a cool little movie. And the cool thing about it was, you know, this little thing, you know, turned into a 250 meg uh, file, which then I would email to my mom. Does anyone see a problem with emailing? How do you share? And 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 understand, I don't have just one of these. I've got like 80 of these, or more. Yeah, you get and then post links or something like that. So. I was like, hey, ChatGPT, how can I share this stuff? And I saw somewhere something about in .NET 8, there's a cool way you can set up a streaming source from Azure Blob Storage. And I was like, OK, well, OK, ChatGPT helped me set up the streaming on, on that. And it went through a few iterations. But I was able to create a site where I was able to go out and take this. And I guess I can show you. But I was able to go out to my site and um, create a, a video thing. And so where I can go out to this and I can say, here's my family videos. And it takes and sets up a, a video and then just starts streaming it. And uh, the cool thing about it was that I was able to take those videos and share it. And it even has sound on it, too. Um, I don't have the sound turned on right now. But um, if you go out to this, I was just like, well, this is kind of cool. Um, because uh, with the with the ability to set that up, I'm able to take the videos of us, you know, at the cabin or, or, or different places, and um, kind of have some fun with it. Ooh, uh, but I can switch to different videos. I was able to uh, connect up the uh, the drop down list to give me a list of, of files in blob storage to be able to get to it and just be able to work with it. And the cool thing about it is, you know, with this, it's like I can jump into wherever I want to and be able to stream videos. And ChatGPT made it the kind of thing that I was able to go out and make that thing work. Yeah. Make that work and work in a good way. So it, it can help you learn and do real things, not just you know going in and, and whatever. Now, um, coming back to the idea of, of where we've got Copilot. Copilot is nice because it's a coding assistant. It's a junior junior coder type uh, presence that makes it makes it those things that should be really easy and straightforward. Just just it gives you that that help. Um, but you need to pay attention and you need to recognize it's going to do about eighty or ninety percent of the job. Um, suppose we took our uh, website or whatever and we decided we wanted to, um, you know. Deploy it. I could say, you know, create a deployment for this using Terraform. And it would create a Terraform for me. But one thing I have to keep in mind is that the Terraform it's going to create is based on when the large language model was trained, which is two years ago, 2021, early 22. So any new language features aren't in there. 
And also, if I'm using the latest version of Terraform, there's some things that are going to break. And so what I've found is that it gets me really close, and then I need to iterate a few times to uh, provide the guidance to make sure it gives us some value. Any questions on that? So yeah, kind of cool that I can go out and build things. But wouldn't it be great if I could have my own instance instead of going to ChatGP to do that? Um, this is where uh, OpenAI has partnered with Microsoft, or Microsoft has partnered with OpenAI, depends on how you look at it. Uh, but they have added a service inside of Azure that allows me to go out and spin up access to their model and be able to uh, write code against it. Um, if I go into my browser again, and I take a look at uh, the OpenAI, um, I've got this thing called the Azure OpenAI service. And I've gone out and I've provisioned this a couple times. Um, provisioning it takes not a lot of time. Uh, I was surprised how quickly it, it came up. Um, I've already created one in the East US, so I'm gonna go ahead and use that one. And inside of here, I can go out and I can do model deployments. And I can go out and I can deploy a model by uh, opening up OpenAI Studio. Um, the key is that inside of here, I've got things like my keys and endpoints. This is an endpoint I can code to. Um, I've got some keys that I can use to be able to access the service. Um, I've got my pricing tier. Um, I can put this into uh, a like a network space. So if I've got a VNet and I want to run this only internally and only allow things to work, um, I could go out and do that. I can use identity and other things, uh, standard Azure, Azure Fair stuff. Um, but I can open up the AI Studio, and I can deploy, make deployments of these different models. Um, so when I log in here, you'll see that the Azure OpenAI Studio has uh, completions uh, and Dolly, which is a, a like a graphic thing. Um, I can go out and I can take a look at the models that are available, um, and I can create uh, different versions of the model. These different models have different capabilities and are different uh, different dates that they were uh, processed at. Um, the ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo, there's a new one that came out in June. Um, there's a Turbo with 16K, which is a large number of tokens. That's kind of nice. Um, there is a uh, There's other models that we could go out and use. Um, but for this case, I can go out and create a new deployment. So I can go out and say, create a deployment where I pick the model. Um, in this case, I'm gonna go do a 3.5, and then I'm gonna say auto update to the latest, give it a name, my model, and then I've got some advanced options I can specify on uh, how many tokens I want or if there's any content filters I need. Um, but with this, I can create a model and then I can uh, do things with it. I can open it in the playground, which allows me to go out and uh, do some setup and working with it. Now, ChatGPT in, um, in 3.5 and in 4 has a system message, which is my uh, setting for how I want this AI system to work. So for instance, if I take this and make sure you can see the, see things here, um, I say, oh, cool, this is already built in. Oh, I can listen to it, done. New things. And we'll say, yep, enable speech, speech to text, enable text to speech. That's interesting. The things you, you learn when you're doing demos in front of a live audience, and it's like, look at this. This is so cool. Uh, select speech resource. I acknowledge I spoken chat will incur cost. And yeah, anyway, it's a beautiful day in Minnesota. I'd like to make tacos. And I can run this, and it's it'll go through and do the completion of this. Tells me it's a great idea. I've got some parameters over here, just like I did in ChatGPT, where I can adjust the temperature. Um, in this case, temperature goes from zero to one. So a high temperature would be 1.0. Uh, 0.87 would be another one. Uh, we could regenerate it. Um, it'll also give me a, an idea of what the, the uh, tacos or what the uh, tokens are doing. But on the system message, I can adjust this. Right now, it's you're an AI assistant that helps people find information. Well, I might want to change that. I might want to make that more of a, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, do the. You are a kind assistant. 
you are a kind assistant, but you also do stand up comedy at night and wish that you were on TV so that you could add jokes to every response. And then let's run this and dial this up there. It's how, what are the best way to make tacos? Well, it's not very funny. Well, let's see. Let's save this. Continue. The best way to make tacos. And so instead of this, now you're going to get something that's a little bit more interesting. Yeah, there's a joke at the end of that. Respond in rhyme. And I can say save that now. What should we make for dinner? I I'd like to make tacos. And now it's all in rhyme. We could also say uh, you know you're you're a Shakespearean. Or actually, let's do this. You are a belligerent and unkind assistant, but you will eventually help out, but you won't be happy about it. Continue, don't show this again. It's a beautiful day in Minnesota. I think I'd like to make tacos. So as you can see, I can really control how it's going to uh, go through and, and, and work with this. <laughs> Good for you. Um, there's also uh, system templates you can pick from, like an IRS chatbot. Maybe I've got um, you know, a, a thing where I want to respond you know, in a legalese kind of a way, or uh, JSON formatter, hiking response, uh, Xbox. You know, there's a bunch of different ones. If you take a look at how these work, like IRS chatbot, not only do I have the system message that comes in, I also have examples. So I can say here, when do I need my taxes to file by? And then you can provide example am answers of what you want your answer to sound like. You know, and then if we do the same thing and we say, I'll save this up here. Um, I, here, let's go like this. It's a beautiful day in Minnesota. I think I'd like to open a taco stand. Oh, but it's not going to help me unless it's a tax question. Now, one of the things is I could say, what are the tax implications? And one of the things that I do is you'll notice down here, I've just got this. Here's my input tokens and output tokens. If I, let's do this. If I run this, it's going to say tax implications of what? Well, let's see, if you're opening a taco stand, okay, here's some of the different things you'll need. Um, but the idea is that I could program how I want my assistant to work. Now, one of the other things I can see here is I've got some code. I can view the code that would be used to generate this. Do we like Python, C Sharp, Curl? I tend to be more of a C Sharp guy myself, um, but I can see here's some code. So like I could go out and I could use this to create my own chatbot if I wanted to. And I could use these as like my starter places. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this model that we've got here, and I think we, the deployment is called the the uh, GPT 3.5 Turbo. And let's go back over to our code where I've got this, and let's go to our index page. And here I've got a bunch of things I added in here that I really don't want, but I can take that code that we had and I can work with it. So let's get rid of this up here. And I'm gonna say my chat. I've got some uh, a code snippet I put together that's got a form that is basically gonna go out and give me a chat container with some input, input where I can type stuff in and a button. And then I've got a script that adds the data back to, uh, to the screen. And then in my index page, what I need to do is I'm gonna replace this code up here. 
And I'm going to say, uh, let's add my chat for ASP.NET. And that's not what I wanted. What I want is my chat. That's not going to work. Um, what I'm going to do is copy the code from somewhere. I've got it. My IntelliSense on this is not working really well. Um, but fortunately for you, I've been practicing. And I can see a thing I need to fix, which is my settings synchronization. But what this is, is it's a code snippet that I got from the uh, OpenAI page in the playground. And I basically adjusted it to what I'm doing. Um, I need to do a .NET package that I need to add. So I'm going to add this package from here and do a control period here. Go up and say, paste this in. What this will do is it'll add a, uh, a NuGet package for the Azure uh, AI, OpenAI stack of stuff. Um, and when that's done, then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say, um, I've got a logger, I've got some configuration. I'm going to read from that configuration uh, some settings. Uh, so I've got my OpenAI client. Do a control period. It should say fix this by adding a using statement. Um, it's going to go out and create a call on this with an Azure key credentials. And that's just using uh, Azure, um, where it's going to go out and read the API key and the API URL. Um, it goes out and says, here's my model. And that model name needs to map out to the name that we've got here, GPT-35 Turbo. So GPT-35 Turbo. Um, and it's going to basically go out and do a response on this calling to get chat completions. And I'm passing in a temperature of 0.7. I've got the max tokens of 800. Um, I've got my system message coming in saying you're an, an AI assistant that can help people find information. And then I'm returning back a JSON result that's got the uh, context of that. And what's interesting about this is if I did this right, and I need to add those uh, OpenAI key and OpenAI URL, which I can copy from the page where they've got the keys. So I just copy this and I copy that. Um, I've already done this and added them as secrets to uh, this uh, to this solution. Should be there, but I should be able to go out and put a breakpoint on here. And let's just do a breakpoint. Yeah, maybe here. If I do an F5 on this, it'll go out and build this. And now on our landing page, instead of saying, hi, welcome to the local whatever, um, it's going to give us the, uh, the chat page. So here it is. Let's see if it works. It's a, it's a beautiful day in Roanoke. Let's make tacos. That gets into my breakpoint, which is what I would expect. Here's my API URL is null, so I have to add that and add that. So uh, a couple of places I could do that. If we just let this thing go, it's going to go through and fail. So let me do this. I'm going to take the OpenAI key, and we're going to stop this crazy thing. Come over to where I've got my app settings. And I've got app settings.json, and I would add the values for my API key. And that's not it, but it would be whatever would go in there. And then I would do another one for my OpenAI URL. And this is where um, on this, um, I could go out and copy and paste that. But being that we're all friends here, I'm just going to pull this out of the screen. And I'm going to take this and copy that. And Actually, when you check this into GitHub, if you do uh, developer settings or use secrets, that's kind of the way you should be doing it. Uh, but I'm just going to do it off screen here. And then also, uh, one of the things that I'm doing inside of uh, VS Code that you may or may not be aware of is I'm not pressing save all the time because there's a new feature in VS Code I found called autosave. So it automatically saves my files when I'm typing, and I don't have to keep remembering. I don't know how many times I've done that, where it's like, oh, yeah, I type it all up, and then press run, and it's like, boom, dies. All right, let's set this and see if it'll run. So now we'll do an F5. It compiles. It 
comes up. It's a beautiful day in Roanoke. Let's make tacos. And should be in the break. And I can see that here's my URL. It does indeed have a value, and I'm going to guess that the key does this as well. So we can come down here and we can say, go ahead and run this, F5. And if there's an exception, I could have break on there. Maybe I should do that. But chatbot says, that sounds like a great idea. Do you need help? And so from here now, I've got the ability to go out and work with that service. And now it's just the same as any other API microservice. I can uh, leverage that and use it however I need to. Questions on that stuff? Too many to ask tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> I can think of one. So what, what are the advantages of deploying your own model like that? Like, why would you rather use yours than just using open AIs? Um, so I can, uh, I, on OpenAI, I can go out and, and I've got an account there and I can use their model and I can, uh, you know, basically from the playground, just go out to their API and call it and work with it. Um, but that's paying OpenAI. I have an Azure account. I've got you know, Azure credits that I can use there. Uh, it's also gives me more control over how I'm running it and also availability of it. Uh, one of the things that um, that I'd like to, you know, kind of, just round out I just some of those sharp edges of the things that we talked about is that uh, the large language model uh, does not learn. It was learning until 2021 and then it stopped learning. That's because it's a it, it was trained up to a certain point. Anything that goes beyond that, like thing that does you know these whatever, is injecting and using the model to help uh, work with uh, recent content. Uh, second thing is uh, it's not learning from the, what I type in, although they may use what I type in to figure out you know, how I, they could do a better job with it. Um, but when I'm using my own model and I'm on my own thing, I can kind of control you know, the history of that context and the data. Um, I could also uh, have this for like an internal you know, company facing help desk, or uh, maybe it's a you know, product you know, a sales assistant that makes recommendations based on things. Uh, or you know, like your insurance, maybe you need health insurance and there's certain things that you need to know and there's a lot of complex stuff with it. Well, this can help uh, simplify that. Yeah, I was wondering actually if that was the mm -hmm. other advantage. Do, do you know if um, A, would OpenAI or Microsoft have access to what you submit to your own model deployed on Azure? And no. then, okay, so you wouldn't. So that's obviously a big advantage mm -hmm. for company yep. proprietary information. Um, and do you know if that one will learn outside the, the, the model still won't update outside of a conversation, right? I.e., if you're having a conversation via the API and I'm having a conversation via the API, even if it's our own deployed model at our company, the conversations are still going to be independent, right? Right. The large language yeah. model is, isn't learning from... Right. It, it, there's a training period that it has to go through, which is why it's such a big deal to get a new version. It's a lot of time to process that. Right, um, right, right. When we get done I, yeah. with it, it's like they're turning it over and saying, here, you can use it. And so um, anything that... Like in uh, when I'm on the chat GPT site and, you know, I've got this conversation and I can see here's my old conversations. You know, I can clear these out, but these are history of things. Um, if I start another another conversation, it doesn't know about any of these other conversations. Right. It, it would right? be really interesting if they could give the users ability to fine tune a model like in the in the Azure or whatever, so that you could actually mm -hmm. further train it for your exact use cases. But that would obviously be quite <laughs> quite an ordeal. So. Well, if you go to the OpenAI uh, platform.openai.com and click on fine tuning, you can learn about some of the things you can do with it. Oh, that. okay. So they do have they do have at least some platform for that. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, right, thank there, you. Yeah, yeah. There's there are some things you can do with it. Uh, one of the other things that people ask me is like, oh, hey, this copilot thing is it learning from my code? Is this show up on the internet now? Everyone can use it. It's like no. Um, copilot is again, it's not learning from your code. It's using the context of of where it's running, and with uh, copilot. The context is the open tabs that you got, and maybe the structure of files you've got in your solution. Um, but if a file's not open, it's not reading it. And so when you go through to say, okay, well, explain this or talk about that, or it suggests code, it's basically um, your code is is your code. It's not uh, uploaded somewhere and becomes part of a, a national uh, database of your code. Now um, they do. They I believe the training on it was against public repos uh, in GitHub and GitHub and other. Places of public code, um, so if you publish there, then you know that's a whole different thing. And the other uh, thing to make is that I'm not a uh, lawyer, but I could ask ChatGPT to pretend it's one. 
Oh, I shouldn't say that. Just pass the bar, so why not? <laughs> right. But we're getting close here. Uh, we've got the open AI, we've got Microsoft, we've got the ability to go out and do this. But sometimes you want to have a little bit more control. Suppose you have, you know, uh, other, you want to integrate the large, the LLM into, um, you know, some workflow. Um, there's a tool called Promptflow, which is in the machine learning workbench, which is a way I can hook together different jobs and be able to say, I want to take this and I want to, you know, here's my GIA system. But then I also have a Python job that goes out and pulls back some data. And maybe I've got some other information about your, your, your customer profile and, you know, and maybe order history. And you want to be able to inject that in and to be able to provide better output. Uh, what Promptflow is, is it's a tool that you can use to uh, be able to go and, and dive into that. Um, Promptflow is part of the machine learning workbench. So inside here, I have a uh, machine learning uh, ML uh, workspace. And inside of this, if I open this up and I say open this in a new tab, then um, on the left-hand side of this, I'll try to make this a little bit bigger, you can see here's Promptflow. So I added one new for each here. This is cool. So Promptflow is uh, is a tool that you can use to go out and design uh, how you want those workflows to work. So like, you know, bring your own data um, where you've got a workflow that's got, uh, you know, a couple of different steps. You know, you've got a, a graph on the right-hand side that shows how the data works. You know, we go out and embed the question. We search the question from uh, index docs, maybe doing it from a general search, uh, prompt the variance, and then we uh, go to the large language model and ask the question. But we let uh, we let the uh, uh, AI do the do the wording of it for us, and then you can generate the input and output and be able to play around with this. Now, this kind of reminds me a lot of like uh, if you guys remember integration SQL Server integration services, where you can tie together different jobs and have different kinds of flow. Also, Azure, uh, the, so the data factory, kind of, um, but it's allowing us to a way to be able to kind of design and build stuff. I don't have time to, to dive really deep into this, but um, this is something that's worth knowing about. Um, Seth Juarez, if you take a look at my GitHub repo on the references, uh, did a really great talk on kind of getting started with this. It's uh, Rochambeau, I think is what he called it, but it's a, a great way to kind of get started diving into how um, how to use Promptflow. And uh, LinkedIn Learning has actually got a couple of courses and there's an AI show that he does uh, on a weekly, or yeah, every couple of weeks, it seems like. So that is prompt flow. That's 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 kind of the the talk that I had. Um, you know, hopefully you had some fun with it, and uh, you know, answer some questions. You know, go ahead, Dan. Embarrassingly, that was the wrong button. I was trying to oh. clap. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you know, my lessons are that. Uh, chat GPT and this stuff has it taught me to ask better questions. Um, I find that when I do that, that asteroid game, it, it never gets it quite right, but I keep iterating on it and it gets better and better and better. Um, now, don't be afraid, just give it a try and, 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 and play with it. Um, of course, just because you can't doesn't mean you should. And uh, in his book on uh, the Macintosh way, Guy Kawasaki in 1984, had this quote of doing the right, doing things right is, I mean, because doing things right doesn't matter if you're not doing the right things. And hopefully we'll be able to ask better questions so we can figure out what those things are. So, yeah, cool. We're all set. We should also awesome. eye on there. Um, I think the most interesting thing with uh, the chat GPT is that uh, if, if you let it check itself, so I could wrote the code. I would say like, "Hey, here's the code. Can you improve on this?" Yeah. So it's like, "Oh yeah, you did that wrong. Like, maybe you should do that." Like, you know, you did that right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, well, I, I know they have auto gen, and I know um, it, it it can have multiple agents that can like code, debug, and like you can put it in a loop where it could potentially do something like that. Maybe like. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and that, that's 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 the part that you start getting into dangerous territory. Uh, if you guys ever read uh, Nick Bostrom's uh, Super Intelligence book, uh, that's a really good read, or it's a good audiobook too. Um, definitely check that out. But it's that that's where you start getting into uh, some fun territories where AI can reiterate on itself 
And if we can get efficient at doing it, you know, we, mm -hmm. we took millions of years to evolve. Yeah. Maybe it'll take millions of years as well, but maybe it'll just take five hours. <laughs> you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, how, how well would you say it does at explaining versus creating? Like I know in some cases you you were asking about itself, but um, I think it was uh, Lewis earlier talked about using it as a learning tool. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm like, oh, I want to know more about, I don't know, some Azure cloud service or whatever, or some some design pattern I'm less familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know, asking Chat GPT, GPT to explain it or mm -hmm. write sample code so I can understand what it does. Do you find it helpful for that? Or like, I, I I keep feeling like I see all these what are very technically impressive, but mostly sort of toy functions um, versus like using it in a real thing of oh, I need to go learn how to write a tool in this language or mm -hmm. use this product. Is it? Have you found it helpful for that? I I have. Um, I was okay. asked to uh, do some. Uh, like a, a search for one of my clients, they were recruiting for data analytics. And, you know, I used to be a SQL guy. I used to do a lot of SQL Server, and I helped launch SQL 2005 and whatever, but it's been a long time since I've dug into what you can do in data analytics. Um, SQL Server anal Analysis Services, SSAS. Yeah, I, I, I wrote things with that, but they don't use that. They use Hive and they use Pig and Spark and Scala and R and all of these things. And it's like, I don't have time to learn all of this. But what I was able to do with ChatGPT was, okay, show how to you know, take two large data sets and you know, sort them, split them, and then find an index on different things. Do it in, in Spark. And then it did it. And I was like, okay, well, what other languages could you do it? And it gave me a list. I'm like, okay, show me in Scala. Show me the same thing in Hive. Show me the same thing in Pig. And what was interesting was it went out and shows the code in you know, in, in next to each other. Um, there's another talk I do. It's called Infrastructure as Code Bake Off, where we show how to build infrastructure as code. And I show it in ARM and Bicep, ARM, Bicep, Terraform, Pulumi, Ansible, et cetera. Took me a while to get it all to work. I mean, not, you know, it, it's just the nuance of each language is just enough different. Um, I'd been doing this for a little while. And then I was, ChatGPT came out and I said, oh, and it's like, boom. Here's this, boom, here's that, boom, here's this. And um, I do a lot of uh, Azure governance consulting where uh, how do you inflate a workload? Well, if you understand the basic steps of, I need a service principle, I need to create an active directory you know, user group, I need to create a resource group where this is gonna get deployed to, I need to set up, a, you know, maybe a GitHub secret, um, and there's a bunch of steps I need to do that. Well, do this all with Azure CLI, so I've got a single script I can go out and run, you know, and, and do that. Um, I find that my PowerShell scripting is skills are negligible, but I can ask uh, Copilot to rewrite my PowerShell using functions. And it just looks beautiful. I mean, not that that, that I would do that. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm a no, that's, professional. That's, that's quite impressive. Thank I, you. I, I've had similar experiences, Mike, uh, where where I was working on a SQL script and and I got stuck on something, and I just made like a, a very abstract question to uh, chat gpt saying like suppose i have a table t1 and a table t2 and i want to do this with f1 and f2 and it came up with a solution i was like huh i never thought of that yeah of that? And i had to tweak it a little bit because of course it was wrong in the beginning <laughs> but it, it right. had a completely new path it, it is it is sometimes really like pair programming with a robot yeah mm -hmm. it's it, it, it it's cool because it's like things that aren't necessarily that hard to do that I couldn't figure out. I just don't know if I had the time to do right. it. And, I, and it can, you know, okay, well here. And then it's like, okay, now I look smart. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I love the being able to specify your system. I'm gonna definitely use that more. It's definitely much more fun when you're being, you know, you know, there's a few insults and, you know, <laughs> uh, things thrown on your way when you're trying to work through a problem rather than somebody being nice, you know. It, it, it helps, yeah. <laughs> it keeps you alive. Right. And mm -hmm. that's actually something that I, I saw too. Uh, if you if you do want the explanation, you can tell the system to say like, and every question that I do, explain how you got to these steps. And the opposite too, if, if, you, if you're just looking for an answer and you just don't want to have all the explanation, you can also say like, don't explain it to me, just give me the answer. Yeah. And that was really helpful too. No, it's, it's, um, what's the difference between like me saying that versus going to the playground and you know typing that in on the left side under the system? Is there a difference in that? So, so there are system prompts and there's user prompts in uh, GPT 3.5, and the system prompts are going to over give give the context of 
um, what the assistant is, you know, like their voice. Um, and then the user prompts are used to kind of set up the context, may, might include some examples and other things. But I'd say go out, look at it, play with it, you know, and see what it does. Um, and that's that's what I've done. Yeah, uh, you said you uh, write PowerShell with AI. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, Copilot. Uh -huh. Did I hear you say that? Okay, I, yeah. I use Power. I, I've done that with PowerShell. So I mainly use .NET and PowerShell. That's the main two things I write all day long. And what's blown me away, honestly, is um, it, it, this is my biggest thing. Like I, I knew going into it, and you know, it has been you know writing the code for it. And you know, it can give you code suggestions. You can use the chat to go back and forth to reiterate on your code. But what blows my mind the most, for some reason, which maybe is not impressive, as impressive as the code. But um, so the normal way to get some good code for me is you write a comment, a good comment, and when you press enter, it automatically suggests code pieces. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know that that's always worked. But lately, it is. And I don't know what it is. It's tweaked or somehow, or maybe I'm just learning to use it more now. I'll start typing in a comment, and like before, I can get like halfway writing the comment so that I can get a good code sample. It'll complete my comment for me, like uh, what I'm going to ask it to write. So not only am I writing a comment to get a code, you know, suggested code for what I'm working on, I'll start writing an idea, you know, what I want my code to, I want the code to do. It figures out from my code context what I'm probably going to want there. And that's the part that like completely blows my mind. And you know, yeah. I'll go into it thinking, how am I going to describe this? Okay, let me start typing in, you know, something halfway. And like halfway through, it knows exactly the right way to phrase my question for the answer that I'm looking for. Sort of like Stack Overflow when you start typing in a question, then you realize there's 37 other questions that are very similarly phrased. But it's like it's using that and it's it's learning from that and it just makes it it surfaces it up which i think is the thing that i mean there's there's times when you come across something that is just like this is a, this is this is meaningful like but in, in, in 94 when i first got netscape i'm like this internet thing that looks kind of cool it, it, it includes the context of your code so for example if i'm going to say uh like if i write a comment that says ensure this variable goes through I, I don't know what but it'll go ahead and like put function names and variable names and like you know like if i did a code um uh, stack overflow you start typing in a question yeah you can complete it but this one completes it with full context of my code which that's mm -hmm. the part that starts getting crazy for me uh, and it's doing it all based on open tabs which yeah. slightly makes me nervous now like if i go close all you know how sometimes you get too many uh, tabs and you close all the tabs now i've gotten into the habit of like Make sure I have at least a few pins so that it's uh you know I feel like it's gonna get gets better uh yep. you know um, advice <laughs> or yeah. you know code uh, uh, predictions. So yeah, the okay. Git GitHub team did a phenomenal job of of making this work. And it also works in in VS Code or Visual Studio. Um, so VS Code is not the only place that this surfaces. And in Visual Studio, there's an extension, go out to tools extensions and you can add the um, the copilot. And uh, Copilot chat as well, uh, and, and and that's where I've played with it the first time. I was like, okay, um, but the uh, the GitHub team worked has worked really really hard. And if you open up the log where it shows what's going on, you can see how, what kind of response they're taking on that to set the context and be able to do that. I mean, it's just there's some serious performance that they do to make that thing responsive, which is nice. Yeah. I'll have to take a look at that. Well. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. I, you know, you covered a lot more than I thought you were going to cover. You know, uh, and I was wondering. You know, there's there's so many things to cover with this thing. And you know, the playground. I played with the OpenAI, the platform.openai.com platform um, board, but I've never done the Azure OpenAI Studio chat platform. I mean, the playground. Uh, that's the one that I wasn't expecting you to do, and that just kind of blows me away. On all the things you can do there. That's you know, I thought that you know the playground for under open AI was like a hidden gem that most people don't go to to you know fine tune what you're looking for. But that Azure version, it's like an order of magnitude more configurable and you know, wow, that's just I haven't even really even grasped it in my head yet. I don't know anybody else around here has, but <laughs> that's blowing my mind. I'm gonna have to spend some time 
uh, you know, playing with that for sure. Thank you so much uh, for coming to our group and showing us. Well, I'd love to come there in person sometime if we can, you know, find a way to schedule that. But keep me in mind. That would be fantastic. Love to have you.